Hello. Um, thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, I'm presenting for year number two of uh, my take on uh, autonomic dysfunction in headache and uh, specifically a focus on POTS disorder. So POTS is uh, a postural tachycardic syndrome. Um, these disorders, I think, have been requested by a number of the viewers, and so I will define each one as we go through um, and what autonomic dysfunction is, in fact. Um, thank you for having me, and uh, please be sure uh, to, to let us know if this is a helpful topic. Uh, so no disclosures for this topic. We're going to start by trying to define some of the terminology in the title and um, some of the terminology that um, we've been requested to, to answer about autonomic dysfunction related to headache disorders and um, how we might test that dysfunction in the uh, laboratory setting, specifically in the diagnostic laboratory um, setting where uh, clinical diagnoses can be assigned. And then I'll use a couple of um, case presentations to help illustrate how this applies to individuals and different headache disorders. Uh, and then hopefully some take home points. Hello. So the autonomic nervous system is a part of our nervous system that helps our bodies react and balance to our environments. Um, so philosophically speaking, this is where the internal uh, syncs with the external. This is where our nervous system senses what's happening around us and helps us account for it um, through our own physiologic functions. And there's this term homeostasis, which is where our bodies uh, balance with uh, the environment and, and maintain what we call a steady state in the environment. So that means when we go from lying to standing, when we go from hot to cold, when we go from dark to light, it's our autonomic nervous system that helps us uh, adapt to that environmental change. The autonomic nervous system is quite complex structurally and anatomically. Um, it's not necessarily easy to learn all of the specific players, but um, we can break it down into some of the sort of divisions that help us understand it better. The key part of the autonomic nervous system is this is where the coordination of our uh, organs, our visceral system comes in. This is our, our heart and our respiration, our vascular, our bladder, our digestion. Uh, this is where the nervous system influences how those organs function. And this part of our nervous system also helps coordinate between our other systems that we term strictly metabolic. These are where our metabolic systems balance our blood sugar, our um, drives for reproductive uh, behaviors, our drives for being awake uh, or asleep, and our uh, balance in terms of our, our, our kidney functions. This is a, um, not meant to be a specific point-based slide, but an overview of exactly what the autonomic nervous system is coordinating. Basically, you can see each of the major organs pictured here. There's the heart, um, the kidneys, the liver, the lungs, um, each of the, the reproductive nervous system, or a reproductive system, each where the nervous system is influencing those organs to do um, a specific function. And those can best be broken down into two divisions that we call the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Now structurally and functionally, these divisions of the nervous system help us, again, account for our environmental changes. Sympathetic is where we have our uh, fight or flight reactions, specifically where you want to survive and run away from the bear is the classic example. This is what gets your heart pumping fast, your blood pressure going up. Your digestive system goes on standby. Um, and you uh, are in a sort of survival state, everything is activated. 
And that's balanced by the other division of the autonomic nervous system that lets us rest and digest. This is where uh, your blood pressure and heart rate may calm. This is where your GI system and bladder may um, pipe up and start to do their jobs to digest our food, to create urine, to let our, our system sort of process what we've taken in. And the overall effect of all of this is coordinating our responses to environmental and behavioral changes. So how our, our bodies adapt to exercise, how our bodies adapt to stress or um, uh, emotional uh, triggers. Um, this is a part of our nervous system that is helping us balance or compensate. And going back to those terminologies, that sympathetic nervous system seems to happen sort of in these surges that affect all of our organ systems at the same time. And it's a little different in contrast to the parasympathetic nervous system that can, can actually affect sort of one organ system at a time. So they are a little bit organizationally different um, in how they localize. So how is all of this sort of complex physiology measured in a diagnostic way to help us uh, as patients and, and physicians understanding um, conditions to uh, make diagnoses and help guide what types of treatments? So we have a battery of tests that we apply here. Actually, just down the hall, we have an autonomic testing laboratory that helps us test this part of our nervous system. Um, we have a set of tests that are standardized for each um, subject that we call a reflex screen, basically allowing us to test the major segments of the autonomic nervous system. The first is our ability to sweat. Um, this part of the test is called the Q-sweat, and that allows us to trigger a reflex of sweating in the skin on certain sites in the skin, uh, and uh, helps us understand if there's a neuropathy or a problem of the nerves affecting our ability to sweat. We also test the heart function and the specifically heart rate's variability in response to a several different reflexes. Um, one is heart rate uh, changes to deep breathing and the other is to a valsalva, which is a maneuver that we do regularly in our lives when we lift, when we bend over, um, when we cough, when we stand up. Uh, this triggers a reflex called the valsalva or the barrel reflex that allows our blood pressure and heart rate to adjust and compensate for those pressure changes that are created by that uh, reflex. And then lastly, we can measure the sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight part of our nervous system, uh, through that valsalva uh, reflex as well and also through tilt table testing. This tests our ability of our heart rate and our blood pressure to compensate from being uh, positioned in an upright position as opposed to lying down. But the autonomic nervous system, as I mentioned, is a lot of other organs. It's not just our blood pressure and our heart rate and our sweat. It's all kinds of other functions. And so we mentioned the heart function beyond just the nervous system. There are, the, our heart has its own uh, wiring and our, um, the conduction or wiring in, in our heart can go um, off kilter just as its own process. And so we want cardiologists to be involved in the evaluation of any problem with the autonomic nervous system affecting heart rhythms um, in order to understand whether it's part of the heart rhythm based on the wiring of the heart or the heart rhythm based on the outside nervous system control. And it is complementary to get testing from a cardiologist as much as it is to get testing in the autonomic laboratory I just mentioned in order to make different diagnoses of where the problem is originating from. We also have gut function changes that happen with autonomic problems. As I mentioned, when you're resting and digesting, your gut is activated and doing its job. Or if you're on the fight or flight path and running um, on a survival um, uh, mode, your gut may be shut down. And so testing of the gut um, in uh, sort of understanding how it moves and um, 
where uh, the digestion is and isn't working helps us understand uh, how the gut may be play interplaying with the autonomic nervous system. Sleep is something that I haven't yet mentioned, but is also regulated through the autonomic nervous system, and that makes sense. We know sleep to be a restorative, resting phase, and that part of our um, nervous control helps nourish our, our, our nervous system in many ways, um, and sometimes sleep dysfunction occurs when the autonomic nervous system is not working normally. Endocrine function, I mentioned blood sugar control and the interplay between these uh, uh, parts of the nervous system and this metabolic process of, of nervous system function. And rheumatology, rheumatology uh, is on this list because many rheumatologic conditions such as lupus or uh, certain types of inflammatory um, conditions can also impact the autonomic nervous system resulting in neuropathies. And so sometimes uh, an evaluation for inflammatory disorders um, also is complementary. So let's define a couple of the diagnoses that we will talk about when we're talking about autonomic nervous system dysfunction. And then after that, I'll get to how it has to do with migraine and headache disorders. So there's one key term called orthostatic intolerance. This is a general term where we refer that individuals have profound symptoms when they're upright. When they're walking around during daily life, um, they can be disabled by uh, symptoms of uh, rushing heart, lightheadedness or dizziness, fatigue. Um, these things are improved when they lie down um, and thereby um, meets this definition of uh, basically orthostatic means being upright and you're intolerant of the upright position. These can be also accompanied by changes in our physiology. Physiologic changes include tachycardia or rushing of our heart rate, blood pressure instability, um, either bobbing up and down in oscillating fashion or dropping precipitously or even going up precipitously. Um, and then there are variants where orthostatic intolerance develops after a period of time of being upright, and we call that a delayed variant or something that happens after somebody has been up um, uh, exercising or walking or standing for a period of time. And many of these types of uh, problems with orthostatic intolerance can often end result in fainting or something we call syncope. Um, and many individuals with orthostatic intolerance have also experienced syncope um, as a result of this link. Symptoms of orthostatic intolerance have some good linkages towards neurologic change and we understand why they happen. So when people get lightheadedness, when they have a difficult time concentrating, um, sometimes when they get a headache, and sometimes when they have tunnel vision, um, these can be attributed to a relative um, uh, low supply of blood in the brain. Um, these symptoms are a result of, of a change in that blood pressure and heart rate control that I mentioned before, resulting in not enough blood in the brain that can result in some of these symptoms. We also can get racing of our heart, sort of a, a tremulous sensation as a result is that fight or flight or activation of the sympathetic nervous system kicks in. You can get short of breath and you can get extra sweating. These are a result of activation of that part of the nervous system where um, you're trying to compensate for things in your environment but maybe overly aggressive and so people get activation symptoms. And then sensations or symptoms of fatigue and exercise intolerance, um, generalized weakness, uh, nausea and abdominal pain can also be associated and those are thought to be a little bit more non-specific and there's not a specific link um, to, to blood flow to the brain or activation of the autonomic nervous system but we know they're integral to autonomic nervous system function um, and they often accompany the symptoms of orthostatic intolerance. So let me give a couple of patient examples um, to illustrate some of these relationships. So this is an individual, uh, she's uh, 
has had chronic migraine now for about 15 years. She's had about half of that time uh, just progressive difficulty with exercise and severe fatigue, uh, even between periods of exercise. And she gets something she calls payback fatigue, where basically when she engages in activity or exercise of any kind, uh, she gets a, a more severe um, form of fatigue and um, uh, debility after that activity. Um, and she finds that the more uh, stress stress she is or the more sleep deprived she is, the worse this fatigue um, or this payback fatigue can be for her. Um, she also experiences, even though she's profoundly fatigued, difficulty getting to sleep and staying asleep in the form of insomnia. She's not comfortable with temperature changes. She doesn't do well when she gets it's in cold environments, nor when she gets in hot environments. She feels like she doesn't sweat quite like she used to. Um, and she has trouble remembering simple things in her daily life, whereas before she was pretty sharp um, in her estimation. And she heard about the condition of dysautonomia. So dysautonomia is a term that is broadly applied where the autonomic nervous system is not working normally and um, can cause symptoms related to neurologic dysfunction of this domain that we've been talking about. Um, she learned about this term. She comes in and asks, could this be dysautonomia? So as a result, we um, start to look for signs of this part of the nervous system not working. We look at those blood pressure and those heart rate variables that we knew that we see with these types of symptoms. So she had her vital signs, her blood pressure and her heart rate, tested while she was lying, sitting, and standing, and we call this orthostatic vital signs. And sometimes when you have somebody do this type of change, you can see something called orthostatic hypotension, which is where their blood pressure drops uh, from the position of lying to when they go to standing. Though this individual doesn't meet the strict, the current diagnostic criteria for orthostatic hypotension, you can see her blood pressure drops a little bit. It's not so much that you would call it abnormal. So in term, in in seeking uh, uh, additional answers, we had her do tilt table testing, which is a little bit more rigorous of an upright challenge. Um, by uh, being attached to a tilt table, this helps us um, uh, get a, a more robust challenge of our blood pressure and our heart rate responses. And here you can see a nice depiction of what was happening for her when she stands up. So these red lines are her blood pressure. This is her systolic blood pressure and her diastolic blood pressure, that top and bottom number. And this is a heart rate line here, the green line, um, in um, response to um, tilt table testing. Here's where she goes from lying down to standing up attach that tilt table at this line here is where her blood pressure starts to oscillate. You can see how marked that is, that change in the pattern of her blood pressure and her heart rate pattern. And you can see how her heart rate starts to trend up during the entire period she's upright. And then once she's tilted back down, blood pressure sort of stabilizes again and the heart rate comes back down. So what happens normally when we all stand up? So normal physiology, we all have about a liter of blood that goes when we are lying down that shifts down to our pelvis and our legs and pools there. It pools in our lower limbs and what we call our splanchnic circulation, which is just a fancy term for our pelvis and the vasculature that serves it. So about a liter of blood goes from our head and our torso down to the, that level. And in order to help us feel normal while standing up, our blood pressure has to compensate, our heart rate has to compensate. And this all happens through a surge of something called norepinephrine, uh, abbreviated here NE, which is a form of adrenaline that helps our blood pressure and heart rate compensate. And as a result, you can see in contrast to this picture, uh, where the, the, the lines get very wavy, that, that here you actually have um, a, a little bit more stable response. This is where the tilt happened. And there are variations, um, but you can see it holds more steady than this other example here. 
So here's when we bring in the uh, uh, condition of chronic migraine. We know that dizziness is a common symptom in chronic migraine and even in individuals with more episodic migraine. And um, dizziness itself can be caused by a variety of problems with the nervous system. One of those, though, is autonomic dysfunction in the form of orthostatic intolerance. We know that up to 50% of individuals with chronic daily headache have symptoms of orthostatic intolerance and that um, headache or something we call orthostatic headache, specifically headache that's worse when upright and better when lying down, happens in up to 60% of individuals who have a condition called postural tachycardic syndrome or POTS. So this illustrates an overlap between chronic migraine and POTS condition. The tricky part here is understanding the chicken or the egg. Does POTS come on in individuals with chronic migraine because they have this orthostatic intolerance and it sort of escalates with time? Or does chronic migraine come on in an individual who has orthostatic intolerance, is already having these changes in their autonomic nervous system, and then triggers their migraines to happen more often? We don't know this for sure, and it's probably individual and different in each uh, uh, person to some degree. But what we know is that treatment of migraine headache in individuals with orthostatic headache and orthostatic intolerance can actually improve and really impact their symptoms of dizziness and their symptoms while being upright. And directed treatment at stabilizing the orthostatic intolerance that that change in your blood pressure and the heart rate that occurs when standing up can also help. And the main tenants in treatment there are hydration and exercise. And these are things we hear about all of the time in treating various medical conditions, um, but these have a major role in treating orthostatic intolerance or autonomic dysfunction in chronic migraine. So what are the, some of the do's and don'ts in treating the orthostatic intolerance component in chronic migraine? So increasing fluids, and this is something we talk about a lot. Everybody needs to drink maybe a little bit more water. I have my water bottle here for that reason. Um, we should all be taking in um, at least two liters of fluid a day. This is actually a lot more than most of us actually accomplish. And individuals with profound orthostatic intolerance probably need more than that, up to two times that amount. So I give a goal of up to three or four liters in some patients. We also need to balance the water intake with electrolytes. We need a lot of um, different types of electrolytes to help that, um, that water stay in our system and help us. So salt is a major electrolyte and um, we sometimes talk about limiting salt in our diets uh, for blood pressure control. Individuals without blood pressure problems can actually tolerate a little bit more salt as an electrolyte. Other electrolytes include potassium and magnesium. And these can help balance out the effect of salt in our systems so that blood pressure problems don't result. We know that reducing stress in our daily lives and stress management techniques can impact symptoms of orthostatic intolerance and help reduce that activation of that part of our autonomic nervous system that is revving things um, uh, uh, in a bad way. Um, or non-adaptive way. We know that getting more sleep can also help, one, with stress reduction, but also helps as a restorative time where this part of our nervous system gets rebalanced and, re and sort of um, recalibrated um, if it's been getting um, off uh, kilter. And then we know that looking through our daily lives, looking through medications that could worsen orthostatic tolerance, um, making sure that blood sugar and um, anemia are not issues that are further worsening uh, this uh, type of function. These are things our primary care doctors can have a major role in. What should we avoid when we're trying to treat or address orthostatic intolerance? Well, we know that excessive alcohol consumption can result in vascular changes that make uh, orthostatic symptoms much worse. It actually causes our blood vessels to dilate and can make um, some of these blood pressure and heart rate changes exa um, exaggerated. And then as we mentioned with the fluid uh, intake goals, dehydration intuitively um, can also uh, cause additional problems. 
Uh, exposure to excessive heat or exertion in heat, heated environments can make these symptoms worse because exercise and heat both cause uh, dilation of our blood vessels, again, contributing to this blood pressure and heart rate variation, variability that are, uh, are contributing to symptoms. And eating large meals also can exacerbate. So while the blood uh, is rushing to our guts to help us, us digest, it's coming out of our blood vessels, making our blood pressure and heart rate responses a little bit more touchy. Um, having small, frequent meals can help regulate that, and it helps also keep blood sugars stable. Starting medications to address orthostatic intolerance alone um, can be a big mistake. A lot of people don't realize that medicines used to address orthostatic intolerance, specifically blood pressure changes, um, can't work by themselves. They need that fluid and that salt that we've been talking about in order to even function. So in order for medications to have a fair shot, we have to already be doing the things I just mentioned on the previous slide, uh, um, already in the system in, uh, to allow the medicines to do their best work. And then lastly, compression stockings um, have a similar problem in that they don't work by themselves very well. We need the fluids and the electrolytes in our systems in order for a compression garment to actually help. And so a lot of people will wear compression stockings for a period of time and not notice a big impact. It's maybe because they don't have enough fluid and electrolytes on board in order for that to do um, its uh, best job. So here's another case. So there's a young man who's had about a year of unexplained symptoms. He started off with a, a stomach flu that he didn't really feel like he recovered from. This was a pretty classic gut bug where he had a, a nausea and abdominal pain and some diarrhea and vomiting and was very fatigued, but he didn't fully resolve after the acute course of this illness and he continued to have this nausea that was fairly chronic for months and months afterwards. He sought out a pretty extensive GI or gastrointestinal uh, workup in, um, and essentially all the testing was normal except for his gut transit time or his, the motility of his gut was found to be slowed. In the same time that he developed this chronic nausea and abdominal pain, he also developed new headaches and dizziness and some mental uh, cognitive processing trouble and fainted twice. So all of these things, as we've been talking about the different types of organ systems involved in the autonomic nervous system, you can see how this might link together. And he was referred for autonomic testing and evaluation. One moment briefly on the role of fainting in patients um, with autonomic disorders. So fainting is actually quite common. It happens due to a variety of disorders, not just autonomic disorders. It is a problem that occurs across the lifespan. Young people, middle-aged people, older individuals all um, are at risk for fainting on some degree. Though women tend to faint more often than men um, epidemiologically, um, this is probably related to some autonomic function and hormonal differences um, between the sexes. We know that fainting can occur due to cardiac disease and potentially life-threatening causes. So that's the first thing that everybody with fainting should be receiving is a, is a cardiac evaluation. We know that blood pressure changes, deconditioning, um, and as I mentioned, endocrine problems, problems with blood sugar can also impact and lead to fainting. So all of these things are things that, as we mentioned before, your multidisciplinary, multiple different specialties have to be involved when we have symptoms from this part of um, the nervous system because sometimes it's another system that's going awry. If all of these things are, are ruled out, then we have neurologic here at the bottom of the list. This is the minority of fainting, actually. Um, but those individuals with autonomic neurologic problems can also have fainting, and that's where um, the this discussion intersects. So we know that individuals with migraine actually have a higher rate of fainting than, it, than their regular population. This has been observed in a, in a variety of ways. So we know that individuals who have fainted in their lifetime are more likely to have migraine. Um, they're also more likely to have a diagnosis called chronic fatigue syndrome, a diagnosis called gastroparesis, which is slowing of the gut, a diagnosis of interstitial cystitis, which is a bladder problem of irritable bladder where the bladder is not 
functioning predictably, um, and a diagnosis of POTS. We know that the lifetime prevalence of fainting in migraine individuals is much higher than the level in the regular population. And ultimately, these conditions are likely linked in underlying neurologic physiology, um, though we're still working exa out exactly how. Now going back to that young man with the gut bug that didn't go away, uh, and he came in to see us for an autonomic neurologic evaluation, and he had those orthostatic vital signs we saw before with the lying and the standing vital signs. And again, you see here's blood pressure here, his top number dips a little bit, but not very much. Um, but you can see his heart rate goes um, from pretty low resting heart rate to a, a, a marked uh, increase, not quite 30 beats per minute. And this raises the question of whether this uh, gentleman could have the diagnosis of POTS. Postural tachycardia syndrome is defined when a heart rate increases over 30 beats per minute after about 10 minutes of being upright. And this is typically should be accompanied by reproduction of the symptoms that occur for that individual on their daily, uh, the daily basis of their upright um, activities. This is a snapshot of his tilt table testing. So you see again his blood pressure here in the red, the top number and the bottom number, systolic and diastolic, and his heart rate in green. And you can see where he tilts up, his heart rate just rushes right up, um, really definitely over 30 beats per minute increase. But you see very, uh, fairly stable blood pressure. And this is by definition POTS syndrome where blood pressure is quite stable but heart rate is excessively revved up. So POTS as a syndrome is thought to be idiopathic. That means that we don't have a specific cause for most cases of POTS. It is also considered to be a chronic condition that should be present over six months or so before a diagnosis is definite. And that's because sometimes individuals can get transient postural tachycardia or transient signs of POTS after an illness or a surgery, um, but it can resolve on its own within a few months. Um, and thereby not resulting in this diagnosis. We think that the underlying causes of this condition are a number of different um, types of pathology. And so we call POT syndrome a final common pathway for a number of problems that can go on. Two specific examples that are specific to neurologic conditions that I've covered so far are signs of sympathetic dysfunction, specifically a neuropathy of that part of our nervous system, and signs of elevated sympathetic function where there's excessive excitation. That fight or flight part of our nervous system is getting revved up abnormally. This slide is not meant to be um, read in detail. It's designed to, de to um, demonstrate the complexity of this condition and all of the different parts of the nervous system and pathways that are actually probably involved. And so I'm gonna just highlight a couple. So I mentioned before venous pooling, pooling of our blood going from our head and our torso down into our legs when we stand up. In individuals with POTS, this triggers off an increase in their sympathetic output. That can be normal for all of us to compensate for being upright, but in POTS patients, this is excessive. In condition, in, in sort of parallel with that, we get some behavioral changes. We start to get anxious at that sensation of our rushing nervous system as we're standing up, and we start to become hypervigilant to those sensations, and we behaviorally respond to that, which is a normal response. We also have symptoms that are not necessarily linked to being upright. Changes in our gut function, this visceral uh, pain, is it referring to abdominal pain? Sometimes pain elsewhere, myofascial pain is in the muscles and joints. Individuals have headache and chronic fatigue. These are things that we've talked about so far, all culminating in this condition of POTS. So we know that POTS syndrome is happening mostly in females and mostly in a younger population. Um, and again, we don't know exactly why it happens, but we have uh, observed patterns of onset. We know that individuals with certain types of viral infections may be susceptible and develop this condition after that viral infection. We know that surgery and trauma of various types can also trigger off this condition. And in some people, it comes on insidiously, meaning that it just comes on gradually without any clear association. We know that this condition can be worsened by hot environments and large meals, I already mentioned. 
and intuitively by prolonged standing or upright activities, as well as worsened markedly by dehydration and deconditioning. So that brings in the role of exercise in treating POTS, orthostatic intolerance, and I would posit here in this discussion in chronic migraine with symptoms of orthostatic intolerance. Exercise has a role in helping us tone our muscles and tone this part of our nervous system that is compensating and involved in the regulation of our blood pressure, our heart rates, and our energy levels. But it has to be modified in order to be tolerable because we talked about all of these physiologic changes happening. You can't just hop into it and go run a 5K and say, oh, well, that's my exercise. Individuals with this condition need to start with what we call recumbent exercises. So a picture here of a swimmer is a perfect example of what a recumbent exercise is, where it's an individual who's essentially horizontal while they're getting some aerobic challenge. A, ro a recumbent bike is another example. A rowing machine is another example. These are where you're seated or leaning in almost a, a reclined position in order to get some aerobic conditioning. The other key is beginning with something we would call interval training, starting with five or 10 minutes at a time with five and 10 minute breaks coming between an aerobic exercise and then stretching in between. Those intervals allow gradual expansion of the duration of exercise in order to tone and build endurance in a very, very gentle way that can help be more complementary to this condition without really setting people back to that, what we called earlier in the first patient example of payback fatigue. Weight training and core exercising also have a major role because as I mentioned, when people, any of us stand upright, the blood shifts in our bodies. Well, we have internal blood pumps. Our muscles, our core strength, and our thigh strength help us keep the blood from rushing too much into our pelvis and our legs. Toning of those muscles can help improve the pump function and help decrease orthostatic intolerance. And so strengthening of those muscles can, should be part of exercise routines um, designed to combat this type of, of a problem. And then preventing syncope or fainting specifically can be um, can take advantage of these muscles that we just focused on building in the gym. This gentleman making all these funny postures here is actually contracting his his legs um, or his uh, gluteal muscles in order to raise his blood pressure and you see these black squiggles next to each of the postures that's actually a tracing of his blood pressure response to those different maneuvers that can help stabilize or pump up his blood pressure transfer so if he's feeling like he might faint, he can, he can strike a pose and hopefully prevent his, uh, his fainting from progressing. And then compression garments I mentioned a little while ago, um, needing hydration and electrolytes on board to function, compression garments can function sort of as stand-ins for our muscle pump and our muscle strengthening. Um, an abdominal binder or compression uh, on our thighs or our waist level can help our abdominal and our upper leg muscles um, support, be supported while we're building the strength in that exercise routine that I just mentioned. So one last case presentation uh, for a, a, a final condition related. So this is a young woman who uh, is a semi-pro football player. Uh, she has now experienced about six months of uh, headaches and dizziness and near fainting type symptoms as well as new onset sleep tr troubles that came on after she had a series of three concussions uh, during her sport play. She had them several weeks apart and she wasn't able to recover in between. Um, and each time she got a concussion, she felt worse after each one of them. And then ultimately she found that any form of exercise would make these symptoms, this headache, the dizziness, the feeling of fainting significantly worse and she had to stop playing. She had had neurologic examinations by a general neurologist and had normal neurologic function. She had normal brain imaging um, and nobody was able to really explain why she was having this disabling, uh, these dis disabling symptoms or not being able to return to her sport. Um, so she was ultimately referred for autonomic evaluation with these symptoms in mind. 
And here is a, a, an example of what her um, tilt table looked like. So here, instead of having two lines for the blood pressure, we have just one, and this is the average of that top and bottom line you saw before. And then in green, again, we have the heart rate. And you see where she's tilted. Um, she has her heart rate raced up here, and the blood pressure dipped a little bit transiently and then sort of stabilized itself while the heart rate raced along. And this is what she looked like pretty early on after her initial evaluation after that third concussion. Um, incidentally, this is a study patient in one of our research projects. She had had pre-season testing where she was tested on the tilt table before she got her concussions. And you can see the contrast, how stable her blood pressure actually was beforehand. Um, and then uh, again, in contrast, what it looked like 45 minutes, at, or sorry, 48 hours after her last concussion um, in terms of how unstable um, the blood pressure became and how the heart, heart rate raced up. So this brings up post-concussive syndromes and post-traumatic headache as yet another overlap into this domain of headache and the interaction of the autonomic nervous system. We know that post-concussion post-concussion related symptoms can uh, be very variable for individuals. Again, some common themes though, in, in interference in our sleep patterns, interference in our energy levels, uh, often mood is affected, and various forms of dizziness. Um, the difficulty with post-traumatic headache compared to migraine is that it can be, or sorry, compared to other types of headache, is that it can be identical to those other types of headache. And the only differentiating factor is the fact that a, a tra head trauma or a concussion occurred. So if you come in and you simply state your symptoms of the headache, they can look, oh, um, either a third up to two thirds can look like they have or sorry, three quarters can look like they have tension headache as a result of that concussion. Or maybe up to a half can have migraine type headache. And then some have mixed or other variations of headache disorders that we think of as being non-traumatic type headache disorders. So this can be confusing to, to various clinicians who are not experienced in seeing post-traumatic types of headaches because they look exactly like the other forms of headache that we're used to seeing. We know that headache is a very common symptom after any head injury occurs, and up to 90% of individuals after a regular old concussion will experience headache as one of their concussion symptoms. In a majority, gratefully, that completely resolves, and usually within a couple of days, if the concussion is going to resolve, it does. Um, but as individuals have persisting symptoms through uh, the period of weeks, then we start um, regarding this as a post-concussive syndrome, something that's kind of sticking around longer than you might have thought it would. And then once symptoms are sticking around for up to months, now this is when we start calling this post-traumatic headache uh, or specifically persistent or chronic post-traumatic headache. Um, and this is uh, usually cut off after three months as we're uh, calling it this. And many individuals are experiencing these symptoms well beyond a year of, after their um, traumatic injury. So how do we approach post-traumatic headache? Where it's essentially the same as we, we treat the other headache disorders that I mentioned, those subtypes, whether it's a tension type headache, a migraine type headache, or cluster type headache. These are the types of headache that it manifests as are what directs the type of therapy. We know that preventative therapies used for chronic migraine can really impact chronic post-traumatic headache in some individuals. And so these are the, uh, as a list of the short list of main medications used in that setting can impact post-traumatic headache. And then we know that some of the injections, some of the uh, inner, um, the injection type therapies, this is Botox therapy um, or trigger point or nerve block injections can be beneficial in tr post-traumatic headache subtypes as well, depending on how those symptoms manifest. But I would add to this list that you might also consider those same things we've been talking about already with orthostatic intolerance and autonomic nervous system dysfunction. So we know that rest immediately after that injury can impact how that injury progresses and how those symptoms are experienced. So stress reduction, avoiding activating, activating, activation of the nervous system, um, like uh, what we would call screen time or concerts or grocery store shopping or various activities that really rev the symptom and challenge you should be abstained from in those early days. 
A little bit later, you're really focusing on getting adequate sleep, uh, managing mood changes that might have happened, and treating those headaches in a directed fashion. And then ultimately, um, in both stages, uh, behavioral trauma or uh, behavioral therapy can happen if there's a, an emotional traumatic uh, component to this. If it was a, a traumatic, emotionally traumatic event that resulted in the trauma, that too needs addressed in order to, to try to address that ramping up the nervous system that could be contributing to those symptoms. So this slide is very familiar at this point. We've talked about these elements of exercise and electrolytes and fluids. These all come into play with post-traumatic headache for the same reasons that we've been talking about um, and should be considered as part of the treatment approach in post-traumatic headache equally. So um, with that, we have a few more minutes for questions. Um, if anyone wants questions, I wanted to make you aware of two opportunities for additional learning or ways to contribute or potentially uh, 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 help us learn more about these conditions I've discussed. And um, one is research opportunities. We have um, studies that uh, my research group works on with both chronic migraine as well as POTS syndrome uh, as well as post-traumatic headache. We're working to try to tease out what physiology helps us understand those conditions the best um, with the goal of identifying how physiology can inform therapies. So we have a, a number of research opportunities here and um, that are actively enrolling. So if anybody that you know, including people without ever a history of headaches for um, uh, uh, non-headache um, healthy participants are also welcome. Um, this phone number um, would be the number to call here. Um, and then an educational opportunity either for your doctors who need to learn more about POT syndrome, autonomic dysfunction, and the role of headache and pain in those conditions, or patients and caregivers who know individuals with POTS or experience POTS themselves can um, participate in this event. So we have September 28th and 29th. The 28th is for um, providers, uh, physical therapists, social workers, nursing, physicians, students are all invited to participate um, in the Friday event where we'll be learning the physiology and the treatment approaches uh, to the condition of POTS as well as autonomic dysfunction and headaches surrounding it. And then on Saturday we have an all-day event that is the same materials repackaged for uh, a patient and caregiver audience in order to learn more about these conditions. Again, and treatment opportunities and how we can um, try to understand these conditions and what they're doing together um, in, in so, so many uh, people who experience both problems. Um, and our uh, uh, speaker lineup is not fully represented here, but uh, Dr. Chopra is from Brown University. Uh, we have a couple speakers from Mayo Clinic all coming in. They'll speak on that Saturday as well. So I encourage anybody, this link here, um, will give you both uh, patient and caregiver uh, registration information as well as if you want to pass this on to a physician who you know is interested in learning more about this condition, you can direct them to this educational opportunity. It's coming up in just a couple of weeks, so um, I recommend uh, uh, checking it out pretty quick. So with that, I'd love to answer any questions or um, Um, with my condition, I have really struggled with getting up in the mornings. And I used to think it's just the gravity because mm -hmm. I'm laying down the whole time and then getting up and I'll, I'll faint or I'll go and try and make breakfast and drop eggs and get dizzy, you know. So I said to my husband, you take care of the kids for breakfast. I'm staying in bed and I usually sleep in until 9 and I just wake up really slowly, just kind of sit up in bed. Question I have for you. You talk about hydration. Mm -hmm. At night, sometimes there's night sweats. If I wake up in the night, would it help if I drank a full glass of water or did something like that? Would that help with the morning rise? Or yeah, great, not? really, really good question and good observation for your own body. So these types of problems are classically worse in the morning because of physiologic changes that happen while we're sleeping. So when we're sleeping and we're horizontal, our kidneys turn on and they do their job, which is called diuresis, which is make urine. And 
basically dehydrate us. And so the process of being horizontal results in that and most people wake up and they have a little bit more blood pressure instability and they feel worse with these, these symptoms. So the ways to combat that are, one, hydration during the night. That can be a double-edged sword with having to get up to go to the bathroom. Um, but having um, water by your bed stand that you say you set your alarm, you're gonna, your goal is to get up by 7.30, wake up at 7 and drink your water um, before you try to get out of bed. The other thing is putting those compression garments on before getting out of bed at all um, so you don't get that challenge of gravity before you have those support mechanisms on your body that can really help and then another thing that I didn't put in the slide um, that's actually sort of advanced trick is tilting the head of your bed up on a riser so it's actually tilted at an angle of about 15 degrees can trick the kidneys gravity sensors into not doing such a good job at um, dehydrating you through the night and hopefully make those symptoms a little um, less problematic. Thank so, you so yeah. much. Does POTS or any of this just autonomia, is it always consistent every single time like you stand up you have the same mm -hmm. symptoms or can it be not just like situations like having exercise but can it depend on like time of year and other unknown mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question, too. Um, so it is variable between individuals, but a lot of people with autonomic nervous system dysfunction find that certain times of the year they flare. Um, so there's something called the October slide that happens for autonomic patients that is basically school year starting, all of those little, I don't know, Bu flu bugs or whatever, cold bugs that we all share as we're going back to school, something in the environment triggers off worsening of symptoms. And we don't know exactly what that is, but it's probably multiple things at once. Um, so definitely time of year. Um, people also can find altitude affects them. People can find time of the month affects them. Um, people can find different foods um, affect them. So it's very variable for individuals and uh, the main goal is to figure out what your specific triggers are and modify those as best in your environment as you can. And if it's a time of year thing, then you sort of just, all right, I know October's sort of a bad month, but I know it gets better in November. So you sort of kind of um, roll with it and prepare for it. And maybe those are the times in September to start with that okay, I have my compression garments, I have my hydration plan, I have my exercise plan, I'm gonna really try to get on track with those before I get into the bad time of year. But that definitely happens. Yeah. What would you suggest, like, if you're thinking that you might have this unknown or some other thing, what are the first steps? The first steps are really these lifestyle changes that it, it's, it's easy to ignore them because they sound so mundane. Everybody hears about uh, exercise and hydration for all kinds of problems. Um, but it's maybe a little bit more adherence than we had ever thought was necessary. We really, really do need that large amount of fluid in our systems. We really do need exercise every day to benefit from it when this part of our nervous system is affected. So it's, an, uh, it's a level of adherence that most everyone who hears that advice doesn't necessarily do. Um, so that really is the first step, is I always tell my patients to be a grade A student in those like lifestyle-based things before I'll even give them a medicine um, because the medicines, again, don't help as much unless those other things are on board. Good questions. Thank you. All right, well, I'll stick around a little while.